You've been the GoBundant CEO for two years now. Sound right? Yeah, maybe a little less, but approximately. What's the biggest disappointment you've had as the CEO of GoBundance? Mm, being accused of gender discriminating against somebody. Wow. How did that, uh, was it disappointing because it feels ridiculous or did you question whether or not there's some bias that you have that's manifesting in a way you can't see? Yeah, the, the first is disappointing because it's just, couldn't be further from the truth. I mean, my entire leadership team minus myself and one other was, is, is female. Um, you know, I just have a ton of respect for humans. It doesn't matter the gender. It doesn't matter, matter the race. None of that matters to me. And so, you know, to be accused of those things is probably the biggest disappointment. Um, I understand people get frustrated and, and life happens, but to try to like question someone's character and their integrity as a human being through that process was just disappointing. Did you, um, I don't know how far you can go into this. Are you able to add any context? Not yet, but eventually. Yeah. yeah. Man, I share this. I, years ago when I worked for Progressive, I, I uh, terminated an employee who was a, a black woman, black female. And she was a long-term employee. And it's funny, she was, um, if you look at what people documented versus what she was told, it was yeah. very different. She was told something and then she, it was documented a bit more harshly. So reading about her, it was like, something's up here, but talking to her and then talking to people that talked to her, it was completely different. So I, I became the guy that I think in an empathetic way held her accountable and it ended with her uh, quitting, being terminated, kind of a weird moment. But the yeah. same thing, I was, it was instantly uh, that I was accused of racial and gender discrimination. I had the, um, uh, what do they call themselves? Not the, it, it was a, a labor board, like a fair, fair, fair labor board. I can't think of the yeah. name of them. It's an acronym. Do you, can you think of it? No, no, but I know what you're talking about. Yeah. Um, anyway, they had to do an investigation. Uh, there was a lawsuit filed. I was, I was, uh, uh, um, uh, what do you call it? Deposition, deposed yeah, for deposed. Yeah. Oof, days. It was forever. And the person that made the accusation was present on the deposition virtually. Um, so that was an awkward moment of like having to, having to know yeah. that all my words are being, are being filtered through this individual's uh, ears. But I'll be honest, man, like I, I sat back and questioned myself at the time, like, is there something maybe I don't see? Is there is there something I don't recognize? Like, I, like you said, like, it's ridiculous. Like, I have no hate for this person because of their race or their gender or anything like that. And I, I don't. I, I mean, you know what I mean? But like, it didn't play a role in me holding this person accountable, but it did jar me. It did make me really question myself and like, what do I not see? So for you, what is a lesson out of all of this, if any, that was my lesson. That's not your lesson, but what's a lesson you've learned in all of this in whatever it might be, how you interact yeah. with others, how you hire fire, um, you know, any of your own biases, if you, if you have questioned them, what's a big lesson you've taken from this experience so far? You know, honestly, the biggest lesson I've taken from it is, is business is hard. Um, and it's not always fair. It's not always right. It's hard. Uh, and the other thing I would say is just that like everything, some everything takes time to work itself out. So like in the moment that it first happened, I felt like physically sick. Like I was disgusted. I was distraught. I was sad. I was, you know, like, do I even want to do this? Like, if this is what's going to happen, do I even want to be a part of this? And, you know, what I recognize is just like things happen, things take time. And, you know, I hold no grudges against people, man. Everybody has the experience and the lens by which they look. And I, I was reading a study recently that said something like, 90% of what actually happens to us, we don't remember accurately. Like we all have this like hint of delusion, if you will, like all humans, my children, your children, our spouses, myself. Uh, and a lot of times as people, we hear and feel and see what we want to hear and feel and see, not necessarily always what we hear and feel and see. And so, you know, it's just business is hard. You know, one of the things that I've uh, really worked a lot on is communication. And so, you know, I would have conversations differently now and, and just saying things to people like what I hear you saying is blank and then pausing and let, let, let them speak so that they can say, no, 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 you're misunderstanding or yes, 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 you're understanding correctly. So I do that a lot. But I mean, honestly, man, the biggest lesson is just like business is hard. Everybody mm -hmm. looks at like the social media post or everybody looks at like you on a stage and they're like, wow, that looks so cool. That looks so fun. That would be amazing. It'd be awesome to be Cody Sanchez. It'd be amazing to be Jamie Gruber. It'd be awesome to be David Osborne. But they don't understand all of like the other things that go on behind the scenes, like the people throwing shade at you, the people trying to attack you, the people you know trying to pull you down. And um, it's just hard, man. It's just business is hard. It really do is. You, 
Have you ever heard the, uh, the, like the idea of, of gravitropic versus phototropic growth in a yeah. tree? Yeah. Fascinates me. It's what you talked about, right? Like if you think about a seed, you place it underground, darkness, can't see it, can't be seen yep. of a tree. And then it grows gravitropically, gravity toward the earth for a period of time in order to establish roots and all of that. And that's like you said, all that happens when you're trying to build something, become something, do something, achieve something, build the business. It's all happening underground. And only at a certain point, once that root system has been cemented, does it pop up over the ground and the trees yeah. start to grow phototropically toward the light. So to your point, yeah, I can see exactly what you mean. Like all this stuff happens behind the scenes and all people see is that out in front phototropic growth. Wow, look at you're killing it, growing toward the light. It's like, man, the stuff that you're doing gravitropically. I completely get that. Yeah, and, and another great perspective with that is like on hard days, I reminded myself like maybe I'm just a seed and I'm being planted. Like, you know, it feels dark, it feels lonely, but at the end of the day, like maybe I'm just being planted rather than being down, rather than being counted out, rather than being frustrated. I just go, look, it's just, I'm, I'm a seed. I'm being planted. It's going to take time. I've got to remember time on task, the power of momentum, the power of consistency. Um, and then, and then just try to release judgment from everything, man. That's something I've really been working hard on is like, don't judge a human for their actions. Just respect them for who they are. Respect yourself for who you are. Don't hold a grudge. Don't hold anger. Just, just like, look, I see you. I hear you. I understand you. I might not agree with you, but that doesn't mean I judge you for that. It's just a That's different- That's gotta be the hardest thing for you. Has to be. You're yeah, a stamp collector. You're a stamp collector. I am a stamp collector, but but I do it without judgment now. I just do it with-, with uh, How? How? Wait a minute. How do you do it without judgment? Let's let's unpack that. Without, like you're just, you're floating above. You yeah, have like, no judgment in anything that you think about that you that you stamp collect. So let me give you an example. So I, I recently bought a ranch, right? And I'm, yeah. I'm learning about how to breed longhorns. And so I've got this mentor in the industry who's incredible. He's just a wealth of knowledge. He's given me a ton of information. Yesterday, I went and toured his ranch. And he was raving about this bull he has and how they're going to take it into the industry and it's going to change the industry. And this bull is incredible. Well, I bought that bull's offspring, a baby bull. And when I bought it, this was three months ago, he told me about how great it was going to be, how powerful it was going to be, all of these things. And yesterday, for the first time, he goes, and at six months old, and that, when that bull calf is six months old, I'm going to come and I'm going to tell you if that bull should be uh, steered, meaning like, you know, get rid of its ability to reproduce, or if you can keep it a bull. And I'm like, okay, cool. I understand that. Yeah, I look forward to that conversation. Really, what he was telling me is I want to protect the genetics of my bull so that it becomes even more special to the industry. And so he's already trying to plant the seeds to me to tell me that I don't really want you to have that bull calf anymore because I've changed my plan with this bull. I don't judge him for that. I don't resent him for that. Now I remember that I'm keeping it as a stamp, but like he's looking out for his best interest. He's looking out to try to increase the value of what he's produced from an offspring perspective. I don't hold resentment for him, but I do keep a tab of that. I do stamp collect, if you will, and go, okay, so when you wanted me to buy it, you sold it this way and now you're trying to manipulate this other potential outcome, which by the way, hasn't happened. And so that's another lesson in business is a lot of times we water the wrong seed. So we like water these stories in our own brain that aren't reality. And we build up all of this resentment, all of this like anguish, all of this frustration. And then it comes to fruition. And we're like, see, I told you so. Like the reality is, did it really happen that way? Or did you actually manifest it to happen that way? Right? So that's a possibility too, with this bull calf. I just want to be clear. Yeah. But I don't judge him for that. I don't hate him for that. I don't resent him for that. I respect him for that. I'm just sad that he didn't have the courage. If my story is true, and I don't know that to be the fact, but if my story was true, I was just sad that he didn't say, hey, man, I really want to protect the genetics. And I know I told you that this would be your future herd sire and breed all your cows, but I kind of want to protect the DNA. So I, DNA, excuse me. So I might actually have you steer him. I'd be like, okay, cool. I understand that. But instead it's in this like manipulative way. Um, and maybe that's what I hear because I have a tendency to sort of speak that same language, honestly. Um, but I, I, again, I don't judge him for it. I'm just like, okay, cool. I understand. Like I get your perspective and the bull is mine and I can do what I choose to do with it. Like if you tell me to steer it and I don't steer it, like what do you, you don't have any ability to come after me. Now you might not give me advice, you know, might not pour into me. You might hate me. You might try to blackball me in the industry. I get all of those things as a possibility too. But at the end of the day, I have the power to choose what I want to do based on his feedback, my own choices, my own intuition. And I don't judge him for that. 
you just said a minute ago, uh, I was actually going to ask you what else could be true. And you explained that really well, but you just said a minute ago, um, that you communicate that way as well, or that you, you go about the world in that way as well. What I heard is you go about it, your communication style, the way in which you approach a situation like that might be with manipulation. Did I hear that yeah. right? The key to life, it isn't money. It's happiness. And when you measure how happy you are, you actually become even more happy. Our friends at GoBundance, the tribe of millionaires, use a very specific tool to measure their happiness. It's called the Life Happiness Index, and you can have it too. Go over to GoBundance.com slash LHI and take your Life Happiness Index assessment. You'll rate yourself in multiple categories on exactly how happy you are and get a custom output for you specifically that you can use in developing whatever goals you have for your life. GoBundance is the tribe of healthy, wealthy, generous people who choose to live epic lives. And the tool GoBundance members use at the base of all of that is the Life Happiness Index. Get out there and grab life big. Look, man, I, it, I'm, and I'm going to be hated for this comment, but I think one of the greatest strengths all of us humans have is the power to manipulate. You do it. I do it. Our children are freaking masters at it. They're the best at it in the world. But we all have this sort of negative connotation around manipulation. At the end of the day, the media is manipulating us in a way that they want to manipulate us. Social media is manipulating us in a way we want to be manipulated. YouTube, podcasts, it's all an art and a form of manipulation. And I too, yes, have the ability to communicate from a perspective of manipulation. What is the, when you say that, I get the impression that you may have been revealed this through coaching, through communication coaching. Is this something that you've learned through that process or something you always knew? It's something I always knew. It's actually something I've always taken a pride in, but it's something I've been embarrassed to admit out loud. Like, so I've always in my head and in, in my own being have been like, I have the way to create or discover or choose whatever I want to choose. And I understood that one of the ways to get there is the art of manipulation. Um, but I never wanted to tell people that I remember, actually, I had a friend's trip, we went to um, Napa, this was like before we had kids and stuff. And um, my wife and I got like the last minute invite, right. And we said yes, because it was some of our dear friends. And I remember the girls went shopping and the guys went and, and were just at a bar watching football. And I told the guys and I was telling them like, everybody is using everybody. And they got like really offended by that. And um, they're like, explain that, tell us that. I'm like, look, you guys are using me because you knew I would say yes to this trip. And by my wife and I saying yes, it would reduce your cost because we're all sharing a house and the other person backed out. And so you guys are using me and I'm using you because you already had the trip planned. And so now I get to go on a wine trip. You guys get to a discount and an added benefit is now all of us friends are hanging out together. And they got like, furious with me like they were so mad and I was just like ever since that moment I was like okay like my perspectives in my head whether they be true or untrue I'm not certain but they're my beliefs and so I just can't share them vo verbally because people are offended by my perspective so I'm just going to stop sharing it and um, I think I finally got into a place where I'm confident in my own skin to be like look man you're manipulating me I'm manipulating you that's okay said differently we're in business together and we're doing deals that benefit one another like yeah, that's beautiful. And that is manipulation. That's okay. That's all right. Um, and I, again, I'd rather than like judge it and be angry about it. I just accept it and go like, cool. Like as long as it's a win-win, you manipulate me, I manipulate you. That's cool. I don't, I, I don't care. Now, when somebody tries to manipulate to somebody else's detriment, then that's wrong. Like that's, that's not okay. That's not acceptable. And I won't do that, but Have at the end of the day, you know, try to get to a win-win. Have you ever, is there a situation where you oh, use dude. your powers for evil? I'm sure, man, like I couldn't say one off the top of my head, but I'm confident. I mean, I'm a human being like I'm absolutely certain that there's been times where I've manipulated situations to my advantage that hurt somebody else. I mean, I'm sure as a child I did it. I'm sure as an adult I did. It. I'm sure last week I did it. I, nothing jumps out in my head that I could be like, yes, Jamie, this is one of those moments. But yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I'm, sure. I'm sure. It's interesting when you said about like you're, you're right. There's the uh, you said it as like you get this paid uh, par partially paid by me. And the added benefit is that we get to hang out together. And I honestly was thinking of it the opposite way. Like, no, we want to hang out. And the added benefit is I get a little bit of money off as the person yeah. who invited you or whatever. It's interesting that you see it more from a standpoint of like what you were getting from me that you value most maybe is money. That thing. Do you usually, are you usually when you're, when you're at, on guard, is it around money? No, it's not always around money. Now, money is a scoreboard for me. Absolutely. But when what I'm on guard, what do you mean by guard, scoreboard? Sorry. Say, say, what do you mean by scoreboard? 
like for me, that's how I judge my own success. Like, like I was a big athlete growing up and, and when I played soccer, you could look at the scoreboard and if we were the home team and it was one zero, we were winning in life. There isn't really a scoreboard. And so as a way to keep myself sort of engaged, if you will, um, and, and focused on outcomes that I desire, I have built scoreboards for my life using tools like the one sheet inside of GoBundance, using things like a personal financial statement, using things like income, using things like net worth. Those are my scoreboards. And I would ask that people don't judge me for them being my scoreboard. And I don't judge others if that isn't their scoreboard. Like, that's okay. Um, but, it, you know, I would say, like, when I'm on guard the most, to answer your question, is when I feel like I'm being taken advantage of. Um, mm -hmm. Again, manipulate me is great. I'll manipulate you. That's great. That's okay. That's acceptable. But don't take advantage of me. Um, and, and don't, you know, don't try to pull the sheets over my eyes and then, you know, screw me. Don't steal my stuff. Don't, you know, try to lie to me, et cetera. Like those are the things where I get most on guard. Got it. All right. Your, um, your rise and abundance, your, your time in CEO, we talked about, uh, uh, you know, disappointments or challenges. What's the biggest regret that you have in your time as CEO of GoBundance? Um, I wouldn't call it a regret. I would just say the, if you could do lesson, it all over again with the, with the knowledge you have now. Yeah. The lessons I've learned. So the, the first thing I would say was when I first was asked to take on the role, um, I, you know, I said, okay, sure, let's do it. And I immediately said, I need to form this thing called the tribal council. And we formed a group of about 15 people. You're one of them, Jamie. And we said, Hey, we're member led, we're member driven. Let's get a group of our peers together and let's let them help us navigate the future of GoBundance. And knowing what I know now, I would have led that group differently from the start. I don't think I was the man I am today. I don't think I was the leader I am today. I don't think I was confident. I don't think I set that group up for success properly from the gate, uh, from the start. So like, that's one of the things I would do different. Um, another lesson that I'm constantly reminded of is hire slow, fire fast. There's been people that we've let hang around that we shouldn't have let hang around. There's been people that I haven't hired that I should have hired. And there's been people that we hired fast that we should have hired slow and maybe we would have seen some things. So, you know, that's always a lesson in business, I feel, is, is you know, hire, hire slow and fire fast. Um, but again, like, I don't regret anything. I just look at all of them as lessons. I look at all of them from, from a lens of awareness. And then now I have this awareness. Now when the opportunity presents itself, like we're going to see each other in Chicago in a week or so um, for the tribal council, I now have this awareness that I wasn't the leader I needed to be for that group previously. So I have the choice. Do I continue to be that weaker leader? Um, which again is a, is a judgment, but it's not coming from a place of judgment. But do I choose to be that or do I choose to be the new version of myself which may, by the way, offend people because people have gotten comfortable and used to this group gets led in a very nonchalant, let's kind of be friends and hang out and answer a couple of questions. And now it's going to be led in a different way with more accountability, more expectations. And so some people will judge that and say, wow, he's a jerk. He's a dictator. He's, you know, blah, blah, blah. It's corporate, whatever they might say. But the reality is I'm just trying to lead it in a way that helps that group become what I believe it can become for the tribe of GoBundance. And that requires me to be a different version of a leader today than I was two years ago. What, um, what are you, do you have any, I don't know, anything making you nervous about going into that room and coming, coming, coming through with that different energy, different leader? Is there anything that makes you nervous or uncertain or I think this yeah. is the way, but ugh, I'm not so sure. You know, the only thing that makes me uncertain or nervous ever is that I'm not going to be the person I am. Like, I never want to sacrifice myself for anything. And so as I go into like these heavier meetings, let's call them, right, these meetings with some gravitas, with some, some power for the future, I always just get nervous that I'm going to sacrifice myself. And I don't want to do that anymore. I've done that a lot in my life. And I don't want to sacrifice myself. Um, I, tend to, I tend to put others first, which I think is a great trait. But if you're on an airplane, they'll tell you in the event you're flying with children or you want to help somebody else and the cabin loses pressure, put your mask on first before helping someone else. I've been guilty of putting others masks on first. And I'm finally at a place in my life where I'm not willing to do that. And so like I used to sacrifice workouts. I used to sacrifice diet. Like I used to sacrifice my children and I'm no longer doing that. And I'm no longer willing to do that. And so when I go into these meetings, the only thing that causes me angst or nerve is that something's going to happen that. I fall back into that old version of me where 
I'm not living to my true, I, my true core self, but I'm living to the version that I think others want me to be. The elders, the founders, Osborne, Pat Hyben, uh, Tim Rode, Mike McCarthy, I'm sure you interact and deal with them quite a bit as GoBundance grows, goes through its shifts and everything else like that. What is the, the most common theme around praise that you get from them? What are they really, really happy about in your tenure as CEO? You know, I, I, uh, I honestly couldn't really tell you because I don't focus too much on praise. Um, I don't really get lost in the excitement. I don't really get lost in the, that was so great. This is awesome. Well, let's, let's, um, let's rephrase it. What is something that they're really happy with as far as the state of GoBundance? The culture, the culture is back. They're really, really happy that the, the ethos of the tribe, if you will, is, is back to what they had originally founded it on, which is expand again, on being, that. Yeah. Go into it. Yeah. Being member led, being member driven, being, um, you know, the team and I talk about via V I A. So vulnerability, intimacy, and accountability, and doing all of those things at scale, regardless if we're at 10 members or 10,000 members, it doesn't matter. And I think we lost that for a moment in time. I think we became a very corporate environment where people weren't vulnerable, where the settings weren't intimate, meaning there wasn't, you know, 10, 20 guys in the room, there was hundreds of people in the room. And, and members felt as though they were just being commoditized or being sold to. And I think the, the founders of GoBundance are most proud that, like, there's guys entering a room for the first time that within 15 minutes are crying and sharing their deepest, darkest secrets, the, the biggest challenges they're having. Um, there's members helping each other navigate hard times. There's members helping each other, each other navigate opportunities. Um, and they're doing it all from a place of like, what's good for you is good for all of us. Like we can all grow together. We can all make this world better. And I think there was a moment in time where there was a little bit of a step over culture. Like I just got to get over you to get to where I want to go. Um, and, and that, you know, from my perspective has been sort of eliminated from the tribe and we've gotten back to being member led, member driven, focused on being vulnerable in intimate settings. So, you know, 20, 40, 30 guys, it doesn't matter the number, um, and doing it all at scale with accountability. And I, th I think that's what they're most proud of. I, I'd agree. You can see the difference, feel the difference. So it's palpable from what it was from the very beginning when I joined. Uh, to what it is now is very similar. Like you said, it's about the guys. It's uh, it's deep and vulnerable. VIA, as you mentioned. All right. Well, you don't love you don't love praise. Well, so the one the one thing I will tell you just from that comment, one of the hardest things for me within GoBundance um, and and business in general is sometimes business and opportunities have this momentum that is greater than you can control, and understanding that by trying to control it, all you're doing is actually limiting its potential. And so when you're leading team members, when you're leading members, when you're leading events, letting go of this desire for control and this desire for perfectionism is probably one of my hardest challenges because you just don't know what's going to happen. And you got to kind of surrender to the bigger cause. You've got to kind of surrender, surrender to what else could be possible and trust that you're in business with the right people. You're surrounded by the right people. You're taking the right actions and it's going to all be okay. But it's honestly, man, it's hard. It's hard to surrender and be like, all right, guys, like, yeah, I don't, I don't need to proof that email. Just send it like, okay, yeah, I don't need to be on that sales call. Just handle it. Um, and, and, and letting go is, 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 is really hard. It's really hard. Give me context on why that popped up in your mind based on the comment I made. Um, I just, you know, I, I think like what, what I was hearing and what I was feeling is, is that like, GoBundance has evolved into a place where no one human is actually the leader of it, right? Like, you know, okay, cool. Like my title is CEO. You know, what does that mean? That means when everything goes wrong, people call me and when everything goes right, my phone is silent. Like that's really what it means. And that's great. And I'm okay with that. Um, but it also in this culture that we've created, a lot of members have dis ideas and visions and thoughts and concepts. I mean, heck man, I remember when we were sitting in a room and you wanted to take over the podcast and I, I wasn't in the CEO position at that time, but you know, that's a great example of like just having to surrender and going like, I don't know if this is right or not for you, Jamie. I don't know what your brand is going to evolve to. I don't know what you're going to be able to make this podcast, but I'm going to surrender to the vision you have for what's possible and, and obviously hold you accountable and check some metrics and stuff, but I have to surrender to it. And so like, from my perspective, it's just, it's, it's interesting to try to be aware that actually trying to control things as an entrepreneur limits them because all that's possible then is your capabilities. And the second you try to get lost in control, you've all ultimately just put a ceiling on yourself. And more importantly, I think your business, which also puts a ceiling on the people that you surround yourself with from a team perspective. Makes sense. Thanks for that.
Let's flip to the other side because I'm sure you hear it reverberating in your head on a daily basis because you don't like the praise, but you'll take the criticism. What is the what is the most common theme of discontent that the elders have with where GoBundance is right now, or your performance, or both? Um, you know, I think it's just always improving the data. Um, I think as a business leader, the more decisions you can make that are data driven, the better you can be. Um, and you, you can either focus on business from a sniper perspective or from a shotgun perspective. And by the way, both of them can be very, very, very effective. Um, I'm trying to be more of the sniper approach because I'm trying not to rock the boat on a cultural perspective. And I'm trying to make sure that we're not wasting a bunch of energy. Um, and so, you know, I think, you know, just trying to get more data and trying to make more data based decisions like, you know, one of the things that we're focusing on is attrition, right? When I started, the attrition was over 30%. Now we're down to 18.6. But it took me six months to get that data together. And, and I think that like is a is a frustrating thing, probably more for me than anybody. But when I have conversations with the ownership group or the tribal council or anybody that aren't around data, or when people have questions on data, and I go like, you know, I can't tell you that number. I don't know that stat or I don't know that fact. Let me look into it. Like that's probably like the biggest piece of feedback that I've received is like, we've, we've got to get our data together. What about growth? Um, you know, growth hasn't been an issue. Um, I, I really believe that as long as we do the right things as an organization, growth will take care of itself. Um, it's, I agree it's, with you, but I'm saying what's the elders position on growth, how much pressure or how much, cause I mean, look, they went through a period with yeah. a past CEO who definitely wasn't aligned with the culture. So the culture's back. But if there was one thing that other CEO did, he was hyper-focused on growth and you saw all the prosperity and the growth and look, they're business owners at the end of the day, right? Like you grow yeah. or you die. So yeah. growth hasn't been what it was. It's not that it's not yeah. growing, but it's not what it was. It's not this exponential insane mm -hmm. growth. Like it was mm -hmm. like we had for a couple of years there. Are you saying that there's not really any push or pressure or questions around, hey, why aren't we growing at a rate that we were in the past? What's going on? Do we raise the price too fast? Or we, am I, uh, I'm questioning some of the decisions. I'm just curious. Where does growth, what's the, what is the discussion around growth? There is, there's been no criticism or negative feedback around growth. Is I mean, that look, real? It, you said I you'd swear. be vulnerable. VIA. I swear, I'm swear. I swear. I mean, look, like, let's think about it from a real estate perspective, right? Okay. So if you're going to build a single family home. How big is your foundation? I mean, here in Texas, it's probably 18 inches approximately, maybe 20. If you're going to build a multifamily skyscraper that's 30 stories high, how deep is your foundation? Like it's yeah, much more. Hundreds of feet, right? Like yeah. with rebar and posts and all this stuff, right? And so from my perspective, like I believe like at my true core that GoBundance can change the world. Look, like the world we live in today is a little off um, and we need some help. We need great leaders to have the courage, the confidence, and the accountability to step up and lead. They need to lead their communities, they need to lead their families, they need to lead their churches, their schools, and ultimately they need to lead their countries and they need to lead this world. And I believe what we have in GoBundance can truly change the world, or I wouldn't be doing it, man. Like my goal as a human being is to really impact the world in a meaningful way, like a way that I can be proud of when I'm laying on my deathbed and not because Matt King's name's on it. I don't care if my name's attached at all. I just want to be able to look in the mirror and go like, yep, you changed the world for the better. And I truly believe we're doing that with GoBundance. But in order to do that, you need a very big foundation. Like the, the foundation's got to be really, really solid. And so there's zero conversations around growth. There's zero frustrations around growth. The conversations and the frustrations right now are all stemming from, is our foundation as solid as, as, solid as we need it to be? Is the member experience as solid as we need it to be? Is the local chapter model as legit as we need it to be? And if the answer is no, let's fix it because it's better to fix it today and have a solid foundation than build this incredible skyscraper only to watch a corner crumble because we didn't build it the right way. Talk about regional uh, or local chapters for a moment. There have been local chapters. I mean, for yeah. a long time, there's been sort of informal to, to formal local chapters, really member run. Like you said, not a lot of foundation underneath it from a GoBundance overall perspective. Each group has its own WhatsApp. They kind of get together. There's sort of like a, a similarity between them, but not a formal structure now. Yeah. You've just implemented this. What's yep. been what's been the best part and what's been the hardest part of the implementation? The best part is the buy-in from the members. So we're starting to do it in a couple of our, our territories and getting members reaching out to me and saying like, I see what you're doing. I was totally against it. We just had our first local chapter meeting where you split our territory up into two separate chapters. I was pissed at you. I was mad. 
that was the best meeting I've ever attended. I just wanted to tell you, thank you. Like that's been the best part. The hardest part, honestly, is like the structural components, like the legal document, the financial tracking, the LLC creations and setups, the SOPs that have to be in place. Oh crap, we didn't think about that. Oh, how are we going to navigate this? You know, what are we going to do with that thing? So like, those are the hardest parts. Um, and honestly, the hardest part for me is patience. So I'm not a very patient human being. Like I'm pretty much all gas most of the time. And in this regional model, I have been forced to stand on the accelerator and the brake at the same time. And I've been forced to do that because I have a standard for myself that's very high. And again, I want to make sure that foundation is really solid. But I would be lying to you if I said I'm really pleased with the rate at which we've rolled this out. Like it's taken way longer. And, and you know, it's no different than the member portal. Like it's taken way longer. But now we did it and we did it with a member and we did it member led and we did it member driven. And now the feedback from the portal has been incredible. Like this is awesome. It's way easier to navigate. This looks great. Thank you so much. That same person three weeks ago was like, this is ridiculous. Where's the member portal? How do I access this? Right. And so you know, understanding that things take time, they take time to do them the right way. And again, I'll go back to this ranch, like, cause it's something I'm excited about. We're rebuilding a fence. And I had a guy reach out to me. He's like, I can help you build that fence and I can go really fast. And my answer used to be awesome. When can you come? My answer is now, but can you go really well? Can you do it right? Can it be perfect? Because guess what? We can do it really, really fast, but in three weeks, we're going to have to do it again. Mm -hmm. Or we can do it right, take three weeks and never touch it again. And Matt King 12 months ago would have said, let's take the first, let's go really fast and let's figure it out. And then Matt King today responds and goes, speed is awesome. Perfection is better. Can you do it right? Is it part of a CEO's role to refer to themselves in a third person often? Is that a thing? I don't know. I'd have to ask. <laughs> <laughs> like that's my coach. What is the vision for the regional chapters, local chapters? What do you, what do you like? What, what is your, your, I, I, not the structure as much. I get the structure. You're taking uh, uh, chapters, say there's 80 people in a chapter. You have two, three different chapters within that chapter, within that region. Um, and you've got a structure and curriculum and content and everything that those people kind of jive around and there's roles within it. But like, what's the vision? What's the, what's the, the thing that you see being the, the, the major advantage to a member as far as being part of a local chapter? Via at scale. So vulnerability, intimacy, and accountability. So if we can get men together 11 times a year on a monthly basis, take one month off for the holidays or whatever, and we can have consistent conversations with consistent structure and consistent locations where members are forced to be vulnerable, where members are in that intimate setting where the, the chapters are capped at 24 people, and we can wrap accountability around it, I think we can truly make an impact on a member's life in, a, in an even deeper way than we already have with GoBundance. And if we impact that member, that means they impact their business. That means they impact their family. That means they impact their community. That means they impact their schools. And at the end of the day, if we can do it right, I think we can change the world. What is a local chapter leader? What is the advantage of being one? A leader, a local chapter a leader. A leader of a local chapter, yeah. Yeah, the advantage is being a leader of leaders. Like if you want the ultimate test, step into a leadership role where you're leading other alpha males and you're trying to lead leaders, people that aren't used to being led, but are used to being the leaders. It will test your humility. It'll test your intelligence. It will test your patience. It will test your abilities. And it will be the most rewarding thing you will ever feel is when you can become that leader of leaders. And I think ultimately what we're chasing inside of GoBundance is not just being leaders, it's being leaders of leaders. And if we can really become leaders of leaders, like what greater thing is there in life, honestly? Like at the end of the day, like that is the ultimate test from my perspective in business and in life. What's your response to those who would say, there's value on my time and I wanna understand how I get the most value specifically for that time. I wanna understand what the value, rep rep what's the transactional value that I get for that time, if any? Yeah, my response to everybody is, what is your definition of value? If your like definition that. of value is money, great. I can talk to you about the ROI if we look at your asset allocation, if we talk about your investment thesis, if we look at your horizontal income, if we look at your cash on cash or your ROI, like I can talk to you about all that stuff. If your value is, is your family loves you more? Great. I'll talk to you about that. If your value is um, you make a greater impact in your, in your community, great. Let's talk about how we can do that, right? Every single one of us has a different definition of value and that's okay. Your value, my value, like our definitions might not be the same. They might be similar. They might be different. But when somebody says like, you know, my time has a value, I'm like, yes, it does. But what's your definition of value? 
And when you ask people questions, oftentimes they don't have the answer. They have these like stories and these responses that they're used to sort of parroting, if you will. And I know that sounds terrible, but they're used to parroting these responses is like, I time block my day. My time is very valuable. What's in it for me? Like, okay, cool. Like that's a really awesome perspective. And let me ask you a question. What is your definition of value? And they pause because they never answered that question. And if I can just get them to answer that question, whether they become a member or not, I've already impacted their life in a positive manner because yeah. having a definition of value will change their actions and maybe help them make different decisions in their future that help bring them more joy because they're actually chasing the true definition of their value rather than this world or this business world's definition of like, what is your dollar per hour rate? And if that's their value, I can help them with that too. Well, you can, but I think that, you know, I think in what you said in the answer, what I hear, and I think, I think this is accurate is if somebody's uh, definition of value is, well, if I'm going to spend time on task, there needs to be a requisite financial return that I can calculate for that. Meaning, you know, hours paid, mm -hmm. that's not your person. That's not the role for them. That's not the person that, that should fulfill that role. You disagree? Um, I, again, I'm trying to reserve judgment. I, I don't, I don't necessarily agree with that because that may be the, the, the yeah, agreement sure. that they came into the tribe with, or the understanding that they came into the tribe with. But what if there's another perspective, just like you said, like, let's go deeper here. Let's talk deeper. Like, okay, cool. I understand that that is what you think your belief is, but you know, let me ask you a question. When you're sitting on your deathbed, are your kids going to talk about what your dollar per hour rate was? Like, no, no. I don't no. care. Right. Yeah. They, have no, they don't, they won't, they won't want to, they're going to talk about the memories. Okay. So is your true definition of value for you, your dollar per hour rate? And if the answer is yes, still great, let's go even deeper. And if it's still, yes, that's awesome. Then yes, Jamie, you're right. They're not the right human. But ultimately what I think people discover is we all have these stories. We all have this programming that we've been given through the experiences we have in our life, whether it's through uh, being a child, whether it's through being an adult, whether it's through our family, whether it's through our, our teachers, whether it's through ex bosses, whether it's through current bosses, whether it's through spouses, we all have these stories, we all have these, these narratives that echo in our mind. And the questions that I'm really wanting people to answer are, do I want to hang on to this story in this narrative? Like, is this truly me? And if it is, that's great. And if it's not awesome, let's change it. You know, it's interesting, just I think about the value proposition of GoBundance and what you just described. So let me, let me, I'll do a little quiz with you. What do you think the number one, and this is my thought, but I think many would agree. What do you think the number one, uh, skill going into 2025, 2028, 2030, 2040, 2050 is, what do you think the number one skill a human can possess going into that time? I have a thought, but I want to hear what yours is. So is it a quiz? Like I'll be judged and graded, or is it a quiz? Like you just want to see how me. aligned we are. Okay. Okay. I think the number one thing that we can have going into 25, 30, whatever, whatever year you have is the ability to pivot and be flexible. Mm -hmm. Nothing is ever going to end the way we thought it should or with the way we thought it could. And so in the moment when things aren't going the way we perceived, do you have the ability to be flexible and pivot? I think that's brilliant. I agree. And What's I yours? Actually, mine is uh, the ability to ask questions. Good question. Yeah, I think, I, I, so I think, uh, you're probably right. So I would probably fail this quiz just like I did school. Um, <laughs> well, let's talk through it. And here's, here's the real, the real, real part of that. Let's look at it financially. What is the, what is the number one technological advancement right now that's going on? And that's just getting bigger and bigger and bigger by the day. It's AI. AI. What is the, what is the, uh, the best way for you to integrate and leverage AI? It's through prompt Question. engineering. Yeah. Questions, right? There's millions, billions of dollars being put into the idea that if you can ask great questions, inputs, uh, input, uh, what do you call it? Uh, engineer. I just said the word input engineering. Is that the word? Yeah, sure. Prompt engineering. Jesus. Prompt inputs, engineering. prompts. If you can create great prompts, then you can leverage this technology, this artificial intelligence to get the greatest possible return. When I think about GoBundance, you spend money to join this community. And really what it comes down to is you're going to be questioned. We had that call the other day yeah. with leads, right? Lead prospects. And you and I together started asking questions of a few of these prospects on their business as they were like kind of surface level as, as is expected. And then it kind of dug deeper a little bit. And by the end of it, one of the, one of the prospects, one of the people that said, Hey, I might want to be a member of GoBundance. 
said like, is this everyday go abundance? Like, like there was just a few questions asked and then like this deep dive, whatever, like the, you said it. I think a lot of people, when they hear me say, or you agree that asking great questions is one of the key skills in the 21st century going forward. And then you overlay it with that, how important it is in context of how artificial intelligence is trending fast and prompt engineering and great inputs are essentially the same as saying, do you know how to ask great questions? Then you can overlay the value of GoBundance between those two things, or you can, you can find the value of GoBundance in between those two things. As you were talking about it, this kind of came to me. This kind of is an epiphany for me. But you do, you get in a local chapter, especially in a local setting, great questions asked of you that you haven't been asked before or that you have, but not by somebody who has the clout, the recognition, the same skill or the, the uh, reputation to be able to ask you that question and hold you to it. So I don't know. I just thought that was an interesting uh, little I, moment. I think, I think you're spot on, man. Like I, I think uh, there's a quote that the, the, val the quality of your life is in direct proportion to the quality of questions you're willing to ask yourself. And, um, it's hard to ask yourself the uncomfortable questions. Yeah. Um, you know, it's not as easy to avoid hard questions from people, from other people. Correct. And if you're in a room with peers that and you respect, who it is. And right. Trust, yes. Yes. It, it's, it's easy. Now I would never take criticism from someone I wouldn't take advice from. All right. But if I'm in a room with peers that have all, you know, done well, quote unquote, if you will, and have all like done some cool stuff that should be respected and looked at. Like, like, let's say I want to start a nonprofit and a guy in the room has a nonprofit that's raised a hundred million dollars and he starts asking me hard questions. Am I going to run from him? Mm. Yeah. Great point. No, not at all. Great point. Not at all. Who's, who would you say is the single biggest influence on the leader that you are today? Yeah. The single biggest one. I mean, it's hard to name one, two come to mind immediately. The first one's my wife. Um, nobody will call you out like your spouse will. And you don't always like the feedback. You don't no, always I never wanna, do. No, never you don't always like want to hear it. <laughs> um, but, but Melissa has been probably like, you know, the most instrumental. Um, and then the other one would be David. I mean, I've worked in David's house for the last 10 years. The guy married Melissa and I, he met our children before our parents did on our first one because they were still on an airplane. Like I would take a bullet for the man and and like he's, you know, literally had the greatest impact on not only me as a leader, but me as a human and just how I think and how I process information, how I ask questions. Um, and, you know, like just just the way I show up is is mostly because of those two people. Focusing in on David Osborne for a moment on that. You've talked about one of your favorite uh, phrases is always to, to uh, R and D. Yeah. Rip off and duplicate, whether it's skill, knowledge, um, processes, whatever, right. You know, not steal, but you know, kind of take and, and make your own, if you will. How do you assess at this point in your, in your, in the arc of your leadership, you're not an old dude, you're still a young guy. How do you assess whether or not your style and the way you show up is duplicative of David mirroring versus authentically you? Yeah, it's, it's a great question. Um, and I would, I would just say that I've had this conversation with myself in my journal a lot. And I would say that honestly, I think it is truly who I am and who I was. And I think it's come out more because of David's leadership, because of David's style. But if I look back to even who I was as a child or who I was as an athlete, like a lot of these patterns and these habits all line up very similarly. Um, and I think it's just uh, become even more pronounced now in business through the leadership of David. What's something in David's leadership that you despise? Uh, I'm guilty of it too, by the way, and it's a lack of communication. Um, I do the same thing he does and like, we think that if we say, yeah, paint the walls and move on, that the walls will get painted the color we wanted them to get painted. And then we come back in the room and the paint is not the same color that we wanted. And then the conversation becomes like, why did you paint them that color? I didn't want them that color. And so, you know, I would, you know, I would look at David and go like, man, he's a minimalist from a communications perspective. And then I'd look in the mirror and go like, and you are too. Um, and so like, you know, it's probably a good lesson for all of us that the thing we despise most in others is probably most prominent in ourselves. 
And rather than being willing or bold enough to accept it of ourselves and see it in ourselves, we just see the negative in others and point at them as they're being bad. Uh, and I've kind of done that and, and said, you know, actually, that's like me, that's who I am. And I despise it because that's really who I am to my core. And I don't, you know, necessarily like it. I'm not necessarily proud of it, but I do accept it. Um, and I despise it because I know that that's who I am too. Well, if you were giving David his uh, performance evaluation yeah. and you had to write something that you think he needs to be better at as a leader that, that you are great at. What is that? What is something that he fails at? That's not just because you recognize it because it's the same as you like poor communication or lack of communication. What would you say? Hey, this is what I'm great at. And David fails at consistently as a leader. Discipline to the plan. Mm -hmm. Um, like discipline to the vision. Uh, I think he, from an entrepreneurial perspective is very ADD and likes to bounce around. And, and I am too, by the way, and I'm very disciplined to the vision. So like the investment thesis, for instance, like if the answer is our investment thesis right now is just say no, I don't care what deal comes across our desk. It's just say no. He's like, well, this one looks good. Well, this one looks good. Well, Hey, you messed up here. You should have done this. You should have done that. It's like, discipline to the plan, like discipline to the vision, like, let's just stay disciplined to it. And like, everybody wants to make judgments off of moments in time, like point in case the stock market, right? Bitcoin, great example, we were on the right before the call, Bitcoin, my Bitcoin's at 65,000. Now you didn't say this. But most people that bought Bitcoin are like, see, I told you so I knew it was going to the moon, I told you it was going to 60,000. I knew it was going to go to 70. Like it's going to be the next thing. Yeah. And they're right for a moment in time. But the answer that I actually would be seeking is, is are they right with their timing? Like, did they get in and did they get out? Most people get in, allow ego to take over, stay in something for too long, and then don't have the discipline to stay true to the vision and get out when it's the right time to depart. And I think that I have that strength and I think I have that ability. Um, and I don't think he necessarily embodies it because he doesn't have to. He's reached a point in his life and his career where he it doesn't really matter. Um, and so, you know, I would, my, my criticism to him would be like, let's stay focused on the vision. I mean, I was literally just before this call texting him and he was telling me how we messed up by not investing in this deal because they've sold hundreds of franchises. And I'm like, dude, it's three months in, let's talk in three years. Like, mm -hmm. and yes, we might've made a mistake and the story's not over. Mm -hmm. Like the checks aren't cashed. You know, so let's not count our chickens before they hatch. And yeah, that, that would be kind of where I would focus. Makes sense. How are we doing so far for you as far as, uh, is this depth or are we still at the surface? What's your perspective? I, I see you, uh, your body language tells me there's depth here. That was good, man. It's a really good conversation. There's, it's really, <laughs> really good questions. Bob, on Bitcoin real quick, I'll tell you two quick little anecdotes. I bought it 50, like an idiot. Like I was one of those, like, it's going to go to a hundred, bought at 50, then it crashed. What was it? 19, 18, something like that. Uh, and just yesterday or two days ago in the middle of this move, I was ready to write it off on my one sheet. I really, I own 2.2 coins, just over two coins. I was ready to write it off on my one sheet. I couldn't find the goddamn drive. I found it. <laughs> I found it this week. And I texted one of the guys in my pod, like, I just made $127,000. Because I like, found it, yeah. What do you mean? I'm like, I found the damn thing. Found Couldn't it believe it. My wife, my wife, she's like, oh, you, because I told her a while ago, like, I, I can't find, I felt bad. And she just, so I told her, like, oh, I found it. She's like, oh, that, yeah, that was there the whole time. I'm like, Jesus Christ. Why didn't she tell you? Uh, what's that? I said, why didn't she tell you? Ay, 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 whatever. But it is what it is. That's my little Bitcoin story. You've been thrust into the spotlight. Not a role that I see for you, nor I think you would admit, is the most comfortable yeah. uh, or the most natural. Let's put it that way. It's not like you're like me. I'm like, hey, look at me. Look at me. Right. That's my whole thing. But not you. That's not your thing. Let's start with why. That's kind of an easy question, but I want to start with why. Why are you why are you more in the spotlight at this point? Um, why am I more in the spotlight? Well, because I, I think that this opportunity has allowed me to see that I have a message and I have a gift that I should deliver to the world. And if I've been given it, who am I to not share it? And so why have I put myself in the spotlight is because I felt like I was being greedy and hoarding it without sharing it. 
And the narrative I had around that was I need to stay humble. I just need to be quiet. I just want to be in the background. I just want to, you know, do all these things. The reality was, is I didn't have the confidence in myself to feel as though I was worthy enough to share with others. Mm. And so why have I been put in the spotlight now is because I finally had the confidence in myself to recognize that I have a different perspective that can be of value to people and who am I not to give it if I have it. What has been surprisingly positive for you in having gone through this sort of morphing into a brand, if you will? What's been like a positive side effect that you maybe didn't expect or anticipate? Just people reaching out to me going like, I read your newsletter. I watched your Instagram video. I applied this. I shared this with a friend and it like made a difference. I mean, there's like, there's a lot of cool feelings in the world, but there's nothing quite like somebody reaching out to you and going like, Hey, I know you didn't know I was watching, but I was watching and I did what you had mentioned you learned to do and it's changed my life for the better. And I just want to say thank you. It's like humbling, like really, really humbling. You're like, I had no idea you were watching. I didn't know anybody opened that newsletter. Like, that's really cool. (laughs) What about the other way? What's been something that's been very, very difficult? Maybe you expected it. Maybe you didn't. Uh, There's a couple things that jump into my mind. The first would be like, the consistency around social media, like it's hard. You're really freaking good at it, but it is a full-time job. And if you are not like super photogenic and camera oriented, like it's not easy to just pull out your phone and start talking to yourself in your screen. Like that's very uncomfortable for me. Um, So that's probably been the most difficult part. Um, You know, of course there's going to be haters and stuff. You know, I remember uh, the lady who runs all of my content stuff, we were looking for like a, a intern videographer for the summer to like capture more content. And she posted in like a, a Facebook group and she doesn't even know I know this. I know this from a friend, but she posted in the Facebook group like, hey, this is what we're looking for, blah, blah, blah. And like there was just a bunch of haters that jump in the thing, like a bu- another idiot that thinks he knows everything that's going to become an influencer, like, oh, another dirt bag, like blah, 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 like people just throwing shade. And you're just like, like, yeah, I can see your perspective. And like, why don't you pick up the phone and call me? Let's have a conversation and see if you still hold that same judgment. If you do, awesome. That's okay. But if you really think that's who I am, like, you know, it's just made me kind of sad to be like, I can't believe the world has that perspective on every single thing. Did it make you feel as though they may be right? No, because I didn't see the comments. So I just didn't, I didn't even know about it. Like, one yeah. of my friends happened to be in this group and he's like, yeah, I saw Haley's post. I'm like, what post? And he like mentioned it. And he's like, yeah, you should have seen all the people just like throwing constant shade at you. I'm like, oh, okay. Like, whatever. Like, I just kind of roll with it. But, um, you know, no, cause I didn't see it. No, but what I mean is like, is it, do you, do you, did you have that bias in advance? If you saw that post of somebody else, you may not have posted or commented. I don't think that's who you are, but in your brain, is it like, oh, here we go. Another friggin'. Gary V wannabe, like, in other words, did it, does that at all play on biases that maybe you've had? And now you're saying, wow, it's a little hypocritical because now I'm that guy. Yeah. Two years ago, I would have had that judgment, but again, I've, I've kind of gotten to a place where I've released judgment. So like, yeah, absolutely. I was the guy that would have looked at that and been like, guy dropped out of college. What does he know? Right. Or whatever judgments now that's me, but whatever judgments I would have wanted to throw in, but I was throwing those judgments out of a place of fear out of a place of like self misery, if you will, of like, man, I want to, I know I have that in me and I'm too afraid to be that. Right. Like I, I want that like jealousy almost, if you will. And so now I kind of like see things and I just have let go of the judgments and the resentments. Like just, just let it be what it's going to be. Like, it's okay. It doesn't, I mean, more power to them. I hope they succeed. And you know, like if somebody has an idea, I might have a perspective on if I think that idea is going to be good or not, but I don't have judgment towards like, they're an idiot for pursuing it. I just have a perspective of, I don't think it's going to work. And I could be totally wrong, but who am I to tell them and hold a judgment that they're an idiot or doing the wrong thing? Because I'm not always right. And like, that's okay. Like I don't want to be right. I, I, I just, yeah. yeah, I get that. I, I look at, I look at brand as a hard asset, as something yeah. that's to be invested in and has, has, uh, has upside value, you know, if, if invested in, in, you know, your time, yeah. energy and money, like anything, how, what do you see as the future of your brand? Is it, is it what it is as long as you're the CEO of GoBundance? Have you sort of seen beyond that potentially, or do you see potentially if you, you or GoBundance decided you're not in the role is brand now 
an asset that you consider as an investable entity that you would go into, or is it only something you see that's of value while you're in the role of GoBundant CEO for you personally? Uh, it's an asset that I want to invest in. It's an asset that I have invested a lot of money in a lot, a lot of time in for sure. Um, and I think it all, you know, again, like I'm a big visioner, right? And so like, as a kid, we do this thing called daydreaming, right? I want to be an athlete someday. And so when we're playing pick up baseball in the backyard, we dream of being that baseball player that hits the home run to win the world series. And you see the kid yelling and the crowd goes wild. And he's like, he's like excited about it. Right. As we get older, we lose that for some reason. And I, I don't really know why, but I'm trying to figure out why we lose that. Um, and I'm trying to like get back to it. So we went to this concert. It's sort of been about a year ago, maybe a little less, maybe nine months ago. And uh, I didn't really want to be at the concert because I don't really like concerts. But my wife was there and we had two friends from out of town and we were at this concert. And I was sitting there and I was like, OK, so I could either be here and be miserable and be moany about like I'm at this concert or I could just be here and be present with my thoughts and see what pops up. And I started daydreaming, like I started daydreaming of like, what if I could be a conduit for good? What if I could pour into people such that I was on that stage and all these people were cheering and all these people were having better experiences because of the perspectives that I was sharing or the information that I was sharing. And so I had this like vision and I had this sort of like daydream, if you will. And I'm like holding on to that dream and I'm like trying to live it every day because as I raise my children, I don't want them to not have the courage to chase their dreams. Mm. And the only way they're going to have the courage to chase their dreams are if I have the courage to chase mine. Because our kids aren't going to do what we say. Our employees aren't going to do what we say. Our spouses aren't going to do what we say. Our communities aren't going to do what we say. They're going to do what we do. So I'm like, I'm going to chase this dream. I'm going to talk about this dream. I'm going to share this dream. I'm going to share this perspective. And then I'm going to invest in it. And so I see the brand as a way, as a staircase, if you will, to that dream of being able to impact lives. The, your brand is closely, obviously, associated with GoBundance. We've had this discussion about me. You know, my brand started in, you know, kind of a lot, a lot of alignment with GoBundance, especially with the podcast and everything. And, and as I moved to the DR, I've kind of like had this other wing of my brand, if you will, that's taken off on DR guy. Does that align? Does that align as a guy with GoBundance? Yeah. Right? We, we talk, we'll talk about that in Chicago in a couple of days. Um, but for you, to what extent or to what degree do you have brand for you versus brand for GoBundance right now? And how do you see that going forward? Yeah, I kind of I kind of wrestled with this idea and candidly I've struggled with it a little bit, but I've come to this place of like I have a brand for me that's attached to the brand of GoBundance. Think Aaron Rodgers, right? I was a, I'm a huge Packers fan. So let's just let's just go to the most dramatic analogy ever. Aaron Rodgers' brand was very closely aligned with the Green Bay Packers. His legacy is very closely aligned with the Green Bay Packers. And regardless of where he ends up and whatever happens, it will be aligned with the Green Bay Packers and wherever else he goes, right? And so um, I've kind of looked at it from that lens, like whatever happens with GoBundance, which I have no plans for anything bad to happen, but no, whatever happens with GoBundance, yeah. it is a part of me. It's a part of my story. Like Aaron Rodgers may not be the quarterback he is today had the Green Bay Packers not bet on him. So he has a ton of admiration. He has a ton of respect. Might he have some criticism for him or some suggestions on how they could have done things differently? Maybe. And they may have criticisms and judgments for what he could have done differently. That's okay. But he wouldn't be, well, I shouldn't say he wouldn't. He may not be where he's at without the Green Bay Packers. And the same could be true of me. The same could be true of you. The same could be true of anybody listening. And so, you know, I, I look at it as, as my brand that's closely affili affiliated to the group that's bet on me that I'll have a, a ton of respect and a ton of admiration for for my entire life, regardless of what happens. And again, I have no plans of anything bad happening. But I might not be the man I am. I might not be the husband I am. I might not be the father I am had it not been for GoBundance betting on me to become a Go Crew member, to volunteer in the back of a room to make sure guys had water and to then lead one of the owner's uh, family offices and then to lead the tribe in its entirety. Like, how grateful am I for this? And so I, I look at it from that perspective, that lens. Yeah, that makes sense. So is it safe to say that your brand, as we watch you, we watch your content, we watch you grow, your brand is you that is just running in parallel. You're on the roster of GoBundance, essentially. And if ever you disconnected from that roster, you're traded to the Jets, in essence, um, that 
you know, whatever. It's still like that, that content still exists and I still continue on as who I am associated to myself or any other brand at that point. Is that kind of the, the way yeah, in which absolutely. you're seeing your brand? Yeah. yeah Got it. Absolutely. Okay. It's like, again, the, the, the Rogers analogy, like I hope people, if, if go says tomorrow, Matt, you're fired, you suck. Great. Mm -hmm. I'll still wear the shirt. I'll still rep the brand and I'll still rep all the content because that was the Jersey. That was the Jersey I wore. That was the Jersey that I wore from this year to this year. And and if it has to be a different Jersey, so be it. I might not want it to be a different Jersey. I might regret that force to be a different Jersey. I might be remorseful. I might be sad, but I'm not going to be resentful. I'm going to, I'm just going to be like yeah. respectful. No, um, I'm the same again, I, I hope it doesn't happen. <laughs> but I am aware that like it's business, it's life. And and sure. I'm serving an opportunity for now. And if at any time the owners decide that they need to go somewhere else, they will. Um, and the only reason they would is because I wasn't being the man I said I was going to be. And at the end of the day, from an accountability perspective, if I'm not leading up to what I need to lead up to in order to take this organization to where we want to take it, I should fire myself before they ever have to have a conversation. Well, and it's, it's not even that dramatic maybe, but it just may be simply, hey, here's the path we want to go and there's nothing wrong with that path. But for you, the bandwidth, the energy, the focus, family issues, whatever it might be, it may not permit that and you may need to yeah. step away. So the decision they make to do something that makes sense doesn't align for you and therefore you step away. So mm -hmm. I get that. That makes perfect sense to your point. Like I'm in the same boat. Like I've been a member, right? So I'm a little, you know, you, you've came up through get, Go Crew and then have blown up with, uh, you know, in David's organization and then eventually became CEO. I came in as a member and then later partner with Emerge and everything else like that. And then the podcast and all of this stuff, I've had a lot of brand association to go abundance. And yeah, like if it ended tomorrow, which maybe it will, who knows, you'll tell me. But if it ended tomorrow, next week, next next week tomorrow. after after that. Chicago, if it ended tomorrow, um, I still wear the shirt. It's still a big part of my story. There's there's life to 40, and then I joined GoBundance, and then there's life since 40. And life since 40 has been dramatically different. And the only thing I can associate to the difference in the five years, I was married to the same woman. I have the same kids. I'm the same guy, meaning like, you know, the same breathing right. entity or whatever. Um, the only thing that changed was I joined this community. That's it. Mm -hmm. So as I Your go, group. my peer group, go abundance. So correct. Who I decided to surround myself with. And I even told a story the other day about, you know, negotiating a deal here in DR the way I wanted to, and then just getting feedback from somebody who, who said you should do this. And I thought that's not possible. And then that came true. You know, like it's, it's crazy to think like you just get around with the good people. And I heard this said the other day, this is a quick aside. I'm going to go all go abundance for a moment. But I heard this from a guy the other day. He said he had a, co a business coach for 13 years that he paid $3,000 a month to for 13 years. And his name is Chris Doe. You ever hear Chris Doe? Dude, follow him. He's D-O, okay. his last name. Incredible. So he was saying he paid this guy for 13 years. He goes, look, I got everything I ever got out of the guy in like the second or third session. He's like, but I stayed with him for 13 years because I continued on occasion to get the thing I needed. Sometimes we just had conversations about life. He's like, but then he quantified that first interaction, that second, third, whatever it was that he's like how it created X number of millions per year. And then over time, what it created and in exchange for that, he paid $560,000 over the course of 13 years, but got 20 million more in value from that. Even if all of that value was in the first $10,000 spent, yeah. does that make sense for me? Yeah, it's, it's that's awesome. how I see, that's how I see go abundance, right? Like yeah, when you first join, it's exciting. And honestly, I didn't get a ton out of the first year because I didn't participate really the first year because I was overwhelmed by it. I was intimidated by abundance. But then year two, this big thing happened. Year three, this big thing happened. Year four, I can't speak to like some earth shattering thing, but I'm in this neighborhood. I'm in this community. Year five, you know, $170,000 deal came across the table that I had to pay nothing for, you know, thanks to connection and abundance. But it was a one random call from a guy I wouldn't have known had I not joined the community five years ago. And what, what bothers me for some members is when they come in with a one and done mindset, what's yeah. this going to do for me? What's going to happen in my year? And it's like nothing because you already have this expectation that somebody or something is going to do something for you. It's yeah. what are you going to do now that you have? It's like getting the big job. Hey, you got the big job. That's not the end. That's the beginning. Now, what are you going to do with that big job? You know? Yeah. And again, like I, it, it wouldn't bother me. It just makes me sad because it's such a limiting perspective, yeah, right? Me. Like <laughs> even the thing I would say to what you just said, you kind of like said year four was like, eh, maybe. But the thing I would ask you is the human who joined GoBundance 
probably would have killed to have the year four experiences. However, 100%. 100%. your perspective has shifted so dramatically that you're like, meh, this is a just a mediocre year. And, and that's what happens in life. Like we evolve and we grow and things that used to feel so incredibly powerful and instrumental in our lives no longer have that gravitas to them because we've already had the experiences, right? Like I've had the great fortune of flying private a ton. I remember the first time it was like, oh my gosh, this is incredible. And like, I've, I've been fortunate to have friends that have flown private and, and taken them private. And they're like, this is incredible. Like, don't you, this is amazing. I'm like, dude, it's just another airplane. Like you just get on, you fly, you land. And I know like people are going to hate that and throw shade at that, but like it is because now that is my new reality. Like it's my new expectation. And so what used to feel special doesn't. And so you have to, again, going back to the conversation on value, figure out what your true definition of value is and really hone in on that and, and don't lose sight of it because as your world expands and grows, things will start to feel less important or less cool or less significant and it's not because they're less significant. It's just because you've evolved and grown as a human. And so your expectations have evolved and grown. hundred percent, hundred percent. And to your point, if I didn't have year four, then I'm not having the conversation in year five. Yeah. That yeah. makes sense. Right. Yeah, like I don't absolutely. know the conversations I haven't had yet, which yeah, is absolutely. like, you know, yeah. Anyway, we'll get into that. There's a, there's a book. You ever hear uh, read the dip by Seth Ro Seth uh, Godin? No, I have not. Yeah, I'll, I'll I'll share it with you. It's it's like an hour long listen if you listen to one five speed on Audible. It's like the it's like a, it's like a podcast in a book. Yeah. Um, but we can talk about that next week. I want to real quick touch back on the regional local. I don't like call them regional. In the merge, we're calling them regional chapters, <laughs> local chapters. The local chapter model that you have in uh, in Elite and Champion right now. Yeah. Um, part of that is uh, like a member shoulder tap. Uh, yeah. The idea of getting members to sort of refer more members. And as a guy who leads Emerge, I could tell you, you know this, the best members we get are referred by other members. Yeah. How do you, or how have you, or have you uh, managed, is that the word? Balanced the idea of growing the organization and growing membership in a, in a smart way without making members feel as though it's more MLM or whatever. Cause I've heard that as a concern. Is this more of a uh, uh, like, Oh, I got to bring in three guys or this sort of thing. So how have you balanced that? Talk a little bit about that just so it's out in the air. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm fortunate that most often that time that conversation comes up, someone in the room stands up and says, look, like I wouldn't be in this room if it wasn't for that initiative. And if I wasn't in this room, my life wouldn't have changed, which means these employees of mine wouldn't have changed. And by the way, like you and I did a deal, our lives wouldn't have changed for it too. And so yeah, I just remind people that again, if what we're surrounded by now becomes the status quo and becomes all that we see, we have a ceiling on our life. And the last thing we ever want in our life is a ceiling. I mean, if you take Warren Buffett's investment analysis, right? Like never cap your upside. So why in your life would you cap your upside? Yes, absolutely protect your downside. Make sure you're protected. Make sure you're not going to go backwards. Make sure you're not going to get harmed, et cetera. I get that. And we're doing that. And we can continue to do that through member referrals. Now we can't avoid it completely, but we can do a really good job of avoiding that with member referrals. But if we stop letting people in, we've now just created a status quo that can no longer be anything more than what it is today, which means the only thing it could be is become less because we're surrounded by this sort of echo chamber, if you will. So you have to bring in new, new perspectives. You have to bring in new experiences. You have to bring in new experts. You have to bring in new value creations from, from different perspectives in order to continue to push the status quo of everybody around. Makes sense. Before I ask a final question, let's just put this out there. Where do you want people to go for you to follow you? And uh, where's the best place for people to go apply for GoBundance and all of that? Yeah. I mean, if, if people are following uh, you, they'll see GoBundance. If people are following me, they'll see GoBundance. They can look up GoBundance on social media or GoBundance at, on the internet. Um, you know, the, the, the Google machine, um, you know, my, Instagram is where I'm probably the most active. I'm thinking about becoming a TikToker so I can dance a little bit more, but I'm not convinced that that's the right thing for me yet. Um, but but honestly, if they're following you, they're following the podcast, they're following me, they're they're seeing GoBundance and, and GoBundance is out there as well. What's your handle? At Matt King? Dot ATX. Dot at ATX. Matt King dot ATX. ATX, Atlanta, Texas. A lot of Austin, Matt Kings in the world, dude. A lot yeah, of Matt yeah, Kings. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Austin, Texas, yeah. Uh, my last question is what have you in your time, your travels, uh, talking to a lot of GoBundance members, entrepreneurs, what is the number one concern, the number one challenge entrepreneurs are facing in our current environment, middle of 2024 that you hear? 
I think it's uncertainty about what the future looks like. And I just keep reminding them that you can't control whatever happens around you. You can only control your response to it. And so like my number one encouragement to them when they say like, what's going to happen with the election? What's going to happen with Bitcoin? What's going to happen with this? Like, what is the vision you have for your life? And what are we going to do today to move it 1% closer tomorrow to move it 1% closer the next day to go 1% closer? And just kind of trying to remind people like what you focus on expands and stay consistent with the vision you have and stay disciplined to following the vision. Now you can change the vision. That's okay. Sure. But don't get lost in this narrative of like, I mean, I was talking to somebody the other day, again, going back to this ranch, I was talking to somebody the other day, like, why did you buy? How did you know now was the right time? What if interest rates come down? Like, well, then I just refinance. What if they go up? I'm like, then I'm fixed. I'm already good. Like, well, shouldn't you have waited to buy till you knew what was going to happen? I'm like, I'll never know what's going to happen. Why would I stop chasing my vision and my dreams waiting for some answer that's never actually going to come. Mm -hmm. I would rather be in control of my own destiny and understand that I have the ability to at least say I tried and failed than have the ghost of regret be dancing on my grave going, you should have bought this. You should have done that. You should have done this. Right. So I think like the number one thing I'm hearing right now is uncertainty. And the number one thing I would encourage everybody to do is don't chase certainty, chase vision and just lead your vision. Well said. Matt King, appreciate you coming on. Thanks for going deep. I appreciate you. Absolutely. (laughs) 